Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the second half uh, of our uh, webinar today. Um, my name is Sanjot Mahendale. For those who don't know, I'm the chair of the Tang Center for Silk Road Studies, and I would all like to welcome you all uh, to the uh, last part of the Gandharan workshop. So we have three talks this afternoon for speakers. Um, what I'd like to do is, um, uh, after uh, our first speaker, Dr. Filigensi's uh, talk, I will uh, entertain some of the questions uh, typed into the Q&A box uh, by uh, members of the audience. Uh, then we'll move on to Professor uh, 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 Mark Allen uh, and Ian McCrabb. And then after that, uh, we'll have... Um, uh, a little bit of a discussion with uh, some of the panelists or the, or the speakers who were here yesterday um, will come sort of uh, uh, would like to, to say a couple of words and, and, and uh, talk about uh, some of the material that is going to be covered in, in these two talks. Uh, and then we'll end with uh, Professor Koizumi's uh, lecture, after which uh, Professor uh, Osman Boperachi will say uh, uh, a few sort of final words summing up uh, the the um, two days uh, that we spent uh, both uh, here in Berkeley and and virtually. So moving on to our first speaker of the afternoon session, uh, Professor Anna Filigenzi. She is associate professor in Indian archaeology and art history at the University of Naples L'Orientale. She's the director of the Italian archaeological mission in Afghanistan, and she's been that since 2004, and a member of the Italian archaeological mission in Pakistan since 1984. Her research publication and teachings are mostly related to the art history and archaeology of the northwest of the Indian subcontinent and Central Asia, with special focus on Gandharan and post-Gandharan periods. Buddhist iconography and architecture. She studies the relationship between religious, culture, politics, and civil society. Uh, an interest in the cultural relationship between Northern Pakistan, Kashmir, Afghanistan, Western Himalaya, and Xinjiang, uh, particularly with regard to the development and circulation of visual art forms. And today uh, she is joining us to talk about uh, the rich history of the Italian excavations in Gandhara. So Professor Filigenzi, uh, welcome to Berkeley virtually. Uh, and also, of course, welcome to um, the, the, the international world of uh, uh, the Zoom webinar. Okay, so thank you so much for this kind of introduction and also many thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me to take part in this interesting workshop. So as um, Professor Sanjot has already said, I will try to il briefly illustrate uh, the results of the uh, activities of the Italian excavations in uh, Gandhara. Obviously, it will be a very quick survey, um, especially of the data which are more relevant to the topic of this webinar. So the Italian archaeological mission in Pakistan is active in SWAT uh, since 1956. And the, I think you already know, all of you know that uh, SWAT um, has been identified since long with the ancient uh, Udiana, which was extolled by the ancient sources as one of the most uh, sacred lands of, Buddhist, of Buddhism for the Buddhist Ecumen. Um, the landscape of Swat uh, is, uh, <laughs> as you can see, full of uh, Buddhist uh, emerging evidence. Um, and um, many of them are still are visible. Others uh, have been uh, excavated and, they, and many others maybe will, uh, are still uh, underground uh, waiting for uh, being uh, properly excavated. Uh, so the archaeological record of, from Swat is really challenging the mainstream notions about Gandharan art, and especially with regard to the uh, original Hellenistic taste of Gandharan art. As we will see, the panorama, um, the picture which emerged from the 
um, archaeological excavations in Swat uh, is much more complex, uh, especially uh, as far as the uh, stylistic history of Gandharan art is concerned. Uh, so our main ref reference point will be uh, Bhutkara 1, which is the, the main um, Buddhist settlement so far excavated in the region. And it, has, uh, it had a very long history uh, because it starts, uh, it was founded in the 3rd century BC and it lasts uh, until the 9th century CE at least. And it, is, it has been identified with the Tolo visited by Sonyun in the 6th century and with the Umatala visit, still visited by the Tibetan pilgrim Orgyampa in the 13th century. See, as you can see, it's a very uh, crowded sacred area. Uh, there is a main stupa which has been reconstructed several, uh, several times, surrounded by 227 minor monuments, which obviously uh, grew in uh, throughout time, uh, and this is um, uh, you can you can see here uh, here uh, the um, first uh, the first uh, the initial stupa which was reconstructed four times. So we have five stupas which are contained one within the other, like the uh, uh, Chinese boxes. Actually, uh, I will um, briefly. Um, briefly uh, outline the history of this uh, stupa from the beginning with the great stupa one which has a very simple form it was founded in the third century bc in the during the maurian period then there is the first renovation which um, uh, which coincides with the indo greek period in the second century bc and then uh, a third reconstruction, which is the one of the most important, uh, which is the, dated to the early first century C, uh, which is to say during the Sakapartian period. And it is exactly during the Sakapartian period that we can see the inception of uh, Dandaran art. Um, on the basis of stratigraphic uh, relationships, uh, the, um, the very high number of sculptures which uh, came from this excavation were divided into three stylistic groups. The first one, the earliest one, is the drawing group, which is so-called because of the flat volumes and the taste for lines uh, instead of the volumes. Then the nat naturalistic, so-called naturalistic group, which is the Hellenistic, let's say the Hellenistic group. And then a third uh, later uh, group, which has been called the stere stereometric group. Um, the, the earliest uh, style, which is to say the drawing group, uh, has been identified, um, safely identified on the basis of the uh, stratigraphic correlation with the great stupa three um, and important uh, very important for this phase are some minor minor uh, stupas uh, which still bear part of their original uh, architectural decoration. These stupas are uh, belong to the same period as the Great Stupa Three, but uh, while the Great Stupa Three, which has which is circular in plan, doesn't change the plan and it uh, remains uh, circular. Uh, then the new stupas which were constructed during this period are already Gandharan stupas with uh, square bases. Unfortunately, nothing of the elevation was uh, preserved, but fortunately enough, we have still, um, uh, still uh, some uh, parts of the uh, original cornices. So, uh, these original cornices contain some um, uh, figural decoration, uh, which was uh, traced also in other uh, architectural uh, elements, where, uh, where also figures, human figures appear. So, on the basis of this correlation, uh, all, the, um, all the sculptures that were uh, um, found in the site uh, and, and not in situ, obviously, could be grouped in one and the same stylistic group thanks to the sharing of the same stylistic affinity, affinities. So we can say that uh, 
safely that the uh, drawing group is the earliest one and it starts or at least we see the inception of this stylistic group within Butkara, uh, the site of Butkara during the Sakapartian period. And the first, uh, um, the first thing to be noted is that the strong group, uh, as you can see, uh, has uh, shares the same, not, not really the same, but many stylistic and iconographic features with the almost contemporary um, production of uh, India, especially, for instance, uh, the, the comparison is very close with the production of uh, Sanchi. And also, what's noticing is also the fact that this, the, the Buddha figures which appear within this drawing group, the earliest one, is much more similar to the uh, Indian Buddha from Mathura than the, uh, to the Hellenistic Buddha we are, accustomed, we are accustomed with and that we, uh, we usually we think to be the most uh, genuine product of uh, Gandharan art. And also I would like to say that the chronological relationship with the, between this earlier drawing group and the later naturalist group uh, is uh, confirmed also by reworked reliefs. We have several of these uh, specimens, um, uh, reliefs belonging to the, uh, to the uh, earliest uh, drawing group, uh, which were reworked in the um, other surface, in the on the opposite surface, and uh, with the uh, following the new trends, which is the uh, which are the trends of the naturalistic group. So we have, uh, thanks to also to this reworked uh, reliefs, the confirmation that the uh, the drawing group is the earliest one, and the naturalistic one is the uh, is um, follows the first one. Um, I would like to spend some other words about the period of Great Stupa III, which is the Sakapartian, uh, which coincides with the Sakapartian uh, period. Um, and uh, um, ask, ask ourselves why the Stupa plan, uh, the circular Stupa plan persists through time uh, and changes. Uh, in spite of the several renovations and also in spite of the fact that the newly uh, built uh, stupas uh, have a square basis. And uh, Facenna, Domenico Facenna, who is, who is the author of the excavations uh, uh, in Butkara, uh, he carefully excavated the site between the second uh, half of the 50s and the uh, early 60s. Uh, he's, uh, he hypothesized that uh, evidently this stupa never changed its plan because it was uh, held as venerable. Uh, and uh, we have uh, some uh, interesting um, uh, relevant evidence provided by the Gandhari studies. This, uh, you, I think you all know uh, that in the last decades we came to know several documents uh, related uh, to the Saka, let's say to the Sakapartian uh, period um, from different parts of uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan and uh, epigraphic um, evidence uh, and uh, also literary uh, evidence have uh, shed light on uh, two uh, local dynasties, um, which were based in Swat, the Odi and the uh, Apracha kings. And these dynasties were uh, allied uh, of the Sakapartian uh, dynasties, uh, to, uh, to, to which uh, they were probably subjected uh, somehow. And um, uh, one very interesting um, confirmation comes for, from, instance, uh, for instance, from this uh, famous reliquary, which is the uh, reliquary of uh, Prince Indravarma, dated to the year 63 of Aziz. And uh, it speaks of Indravarma, son of the king uh, of Apracha. And uh, the most interesting thing from, from our point of view now is that uh, 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 this, uh, this king uh, says that he has uh, established relics in a new uh, stupa, and these relics come from 
uh, Maurya period stupa. So this means that this uh, local uh, dynasties uh, were perfectly conscious of the uh, value uh, of the uh, ancient stupas um, uh, founded by, uh, by the Mauryan uh, kings. I want just to show you, to, to call your attention on this um, uh, relief showing some uh, royal uh, princely donors. So maybe this uh, is just a formulaic uh, scheme, but most probably uh, it is not, because this is a kind of propaganda which is connected to this uh, uh, royal local dynasties. Uh, which were very active in the um, uh, spreading of Buddhism uh, through the establishment of new, um, of new um, stupas or the refurbishment of uh, older um, stupas, as we uh, have just said um, with the uh, inscription on, on the casket, which uh, mentioned uh, the fact that the king has... Um, uh, has taken their reliefs, their reliefs from an older Mauryan uh, stupa. Um, uh, very important evidence with regard to the um, first period of Gandharan art uh, come from Saidu Sharif I, um, which is uh, a very important uh, monument because this is the first uh, one uh, which yielded uh, its original uh, Gandharan narrative frieze. Um, the, I, I want um, I want to linger on the architectural features of the stupa, uh, which are extremely interesting. And I would um, I, I, I want uh, just to show you um, that uh, this um, uh, among the debris of the um, um, of the stupas. Um, a number of um, fragments uh, belonging to the original frieze, uh, narrative frieze, were, uh, were recovered. And we have um, a structural uh, data which confirm uh, that this, uh, um, this frieze was originally uh, meant to be the decoration of the stupa, which means that the, con uh, the um, construction of the stupa and the real realization of, the, um, of this monumental frieze uh, was one and the same project. Um, the stupa has been safely dated to the uh, early first century CE on the basis of, um, of uh, several cross uh, comparisons and uh, uh, with external um, from uh, external evidence, but also uh, safely dated on the basis of the um, of the materials yielded by the excavation, namely coins and inscriptions coming from the uh, uh, annexed monastery, and these are uh, just a few fragments of this um, of this uh, monumental uh, stupa, um, and uh, you have to imagine that these were very big slabs of uh, more than sixty uh, cent centimeters uh, high, uh, and there were mm, almost uh, more or less uh, sixty-five panels. And the fact that this was a narrative stupa, the first one we know, and the only monumental uh, Gandharan narrative frieze we know, and uh, um, and to the best of our knowledge also the earliest one. And the fact that this, uh, these fragments belonged to a complete uh, biographical narrative uh, is also confirmed uh, by the uh, identification of the stories. Some are um, sure, others are, uh, are only probable, uh, but uh, they, in this case, the interpretation of the, of the scene uh, is supported, uh, for instance, uh, by the uh, uh, by the uh, the spot uh, where these uh, these um, fragments were uh, recovered, uh, and so they uh, really uh, all the known um, retrieved 
um, fragments of this um, of this narrative uh, freeze um, coherently um, show the biographical scenes or belong to the uh, narrative of the of the historical Buddha uh, in a uh, chronolog in chronological succession. Mm, uh, I would like also to spend some words on other archaeological indications. Uh, um, uh, sorry, I forgot to say that uh, this, uh, sorry, I, I did just a little bit um, uh, back, backward, uh, that the, uh, uh, we can assign this freeze to a mature phase of the uh, drawing style. We are at the threshold, maybe, of the naturalistic uh, style, but we are still uh, within uh, the uh, drawing group. Um, from the um, uh, from the same site, from Saidu Sharif, uh, some minor mi monuments actually confirm this uh, chronological succession because. Uh, we have uh, in the same sacred, uh, in the terrace of the stupa, next to the main stupas, uh, stupa, uh, we have um, several smaller stupas. Some of them belong to uh, a period a little bit later than the uh, um, construction of the main uh, stupa. And um, we can date, for instance, uh, for instance we have this uh, stupa 38 from which um, uh, eight eight segments of the of the uh, narrative frieze decorating uh, its drum its drum um, and this stupa can be safely uh, dated to uh, the between the first half of the first century ce and the and the end of the first century uh, ce and as you can see uh, by now we are uh, we are in the how to say uh, the naturalistic group, the naturalistic style um, has become uh, predominant. Um, other very interesting um, uh, indications, archaeological indications with regard to the evolution of Gandharan art come from the uh, fourth uh, stupa, the great stupa four, uh, which has a very long um, life. Uh, it was, uh, uh, this is the third reconstruction of the original stupa, and uh, it happened uh, towards the end of the second or uh, during the early third century C, and it, it had a very long time. Uh, which uh, stretches the you know, spans the period from the uh, up to the seventh century C, and this this stupa is extremely important because it marks the shift from uh, stone to stucco in the sculptural uh, production. As you can see, the period of Great Stupa Four is a period of uh, um, uh, hectic uh, uh, building activity. Uh, you can see here in uh, red all the uh, monuments um, belonging to the period of Great Stupa IV. Uh, what is important uh, um, is also that uh, evidently now this, the, uh, the decoration, plastic decoration, uh, is um, conceived in stucco, but still the stone, older stone tradition uh, is um, held as a kind of uh, uh, historical memory of the antiquity of the stupa. And this is maybe the reason why 16 uh, older uh, panels in schist, as you can see, decorated the, uh, the surface of the drum of the stupa. And maybe it's not by chance that they were 16, because you know 16 is a symbolic number in uh, uh, Buddhism. So it seems that 16 panels, all the panels were selected to be the witness of the uh, ancient origin of the stupa, but the aesthetic of the stupa of, uh, is by now something totally uh, different. Uh, once again, we have uh, safe chronological benchmarks to date uh, the, the stupa 
uh, for, uh, thanks to reliquary recesses that were in, embedded into the core masonry of the stupa, and um, uh, the reliquary is, uh, contained uh, coins, uh, and the coins are mostly of the Huvishka and Huvishka type co um, coins. And uh, uh, we have only one later coin, which is a coin of Kavad uh, the first, uh, who was the governor, uh, a governor under Shapur uh, the second, uh, dated to the uh, um, um, toward the half um, mid fourth century uh, CE, but uh, this uh, later coin uh, relates to a kind uh, to a secondary deposit which accompanied the restoration a restoration of this tuba probably after an earthquake. So this means that starting from the uh, um, late second, early third century CE, uh, there has been a shift towards uh, stucco from the old, from stone sculptures to stucco. Uh, obviously, uh, we have uh, lots of fragments of um, stucco sculptures which cannot be related uh, safely to their uh, stratigraphic um, um, location, but. Uh, as you can see from this uh, um, short selection of uh, specimens, uh, there is evidently uh, a di diachron there are evidently diachronic changes. So we can uh, we can uh, uh, assume that there is uh, uh, an earliest the, the earliest production, as you can see, in stock is very uh, still quite similar to the uh, stone uh, production. And then uh, we have uh, a development towards a uh, totally uh, free, um, free, total freedom from the older um, stone tradition and the uh, and, and aesthetic um, uh, dictating its rules. And again, we can be um, we can be uh, sure uh, that uh, this was uh, this shift towards the uh, stucco, uh, which we must um, must also imagine um, vividly decorated by painting, gilding, um, and this was uh, this was the initial in the initial project of uh, Stupa of, uh, Four, because against the um, against the. Uh, the stupa wall, uh, there still there were some uh, bases uh, originally supporting uh, stages, and they were, as you can see, um, um, richly uh, decorated by painting, and in some cases also by uh, gilding. Uh, obviously, after Butkara, in the, in the, especially during the last uh, the last uh, decades, other uh, Buddhist sites were excavated, very important, which yielded very important um, uh, evidence um, with regard to the uh, stylistic uh, history of uh, Gandharan art. Uh, but um, I, since uh, since time is limited, I would like rather to concentrate. On other uh, on other kinds of evidence, which are maybe uh, besides being the newest ones, are also extremely important because this time the evidence uh, come from uh, outside the monasteries, exactly from the uh, urban site of Baricot, which has which is being excavated since. 1984 and is still and the excavation is still ongoing. What we will see uh, is of extremely important uh, importance with regard to chronology, uh, especially because all the context contexts we will see um, uh, fall within the cushion time, um, which and uh, and within three periods in particular, the period uh, period seven. Mm, mm, uh, seven to nine, uh, from the first uh, half of the second century C to the end of the third century or the beginning of the fourth century C. The chronology, the proposed chronologies are uh, 
um, I'm sure because they, the basis is not only a, a coherent uh, assemblage of um, numismatic evidence, but also we have um, several um, calibrated uh, radiocarbon data. And uh, uh, why uh, this uh, comp uh, compressed stratigraphy? Because actually these are the last phases of the, uh, of the uh, urban site, or at least of the um, uh, most uh, of the richest phases of the urban site. Uh, because uh, in, uh, there, there were two uh, earthquakes uh, in, in June in, in, within the interval of um, maybe less than 50 years, uh, which, um, which made this, the site uh, decay and uh, the reoccupation after these two uh, earthquakes uh, are, um, is a very... Um, uh, very uh, poor uh, occupation. So whatever uh, what we will see happened uh, before uh, the reuse uh, reoccupation of the area after the two earthquakes. Um, already in 1992, um, we had excavated a small uh, Buddhist sacred area within the urban peri perimeter, which is a very uh, an extraordinary uh, thing. But what was most extraordinary is the fact that uh, from that small Buddhist sacred area, which is dated to the early mid second century C, um, um, we got some um, astonishing pieces of evidence. Um, very few fragments of um, style of the stucco sculptures. Unfortunately, the site was uh, already had been already plundered, and uh, but this uh, few fragments of stucco uh, is a confirmation of the chronology proposed from uh, for Butkara, and um, also they uh, reveal chrono um, stylistic stylistic features that actually without the support of the archaeological evidence we would have dated uh, much later. But there are, uh, it, during the last uh, years, other, um, other uh, units were excavated and uh, I will very rapidly uh, show you, uh, not without going into details, um, because uh, I, 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 I would like to show you a, a, at least some of the most uh, relevant uh, things because what you will see um, uh, probably will give you um, a very complex picture of uh, Gandharan art because within the monasteries, within the Buddhist settlements, we all obviously we see Buddhist things that sometimes, uh, and sometimes we also see within the Buddhist repertory, uh, some, let's say, alien uh, presences. But here, this, uh, the situation is extremely uh, different, much more complicated, because uh, complicated, uh, like, mm, as life is, I mean, because in, uh, in this urban context, uh, in the city of Barikot, we find, um, uh, small Buddhist sacred areas, sometimes of, they seem to be private, sometimes public, which are vis-a-vis uh, -vis uh, vis -vis other uh, religious buildings of um, unclear nature. And uh, I start with this uh, dwelling unit B, B uh, where there were some um, niches, two niches, um, with, which yielded uh, in a small stele, small Buddhist uh, stele, uh, three of them fixed uh, with the iron nails to the to the walls, and uh, this uh, uh, this uh, Buddhist area was close to uh, another building um, uh, of cultic uh, cultic uh, nature, the so-called Temple Bay. Uh, where we found uh, a stele in the debris of the courtyard, a stele representing uh, Hariti. Uh, 
Also very interesting is the, the so-called dwelling unit uh, day, uh, where uh, there was um, just uh, next to the uh, to the areas we have just seen, uh, where there was a Buddhist uh, shrine, um, and within this Buddhist shrine, uh, we found some reliefs that were probably treasured reliefs, also because especially this one uh, seemed to belong to the um, to the drawing style of the first century uh, C. Mm, also of. Uh, just uh, speaking of the complexity of real life uh, outside monasteries, uh, we found also uh, in, um, uh, in this dwelling unit D in uh, um, what seems to be a private context because uh, we have here a kitchen area uh, within a pot. Uh, my colleagues found this, uh, uh, this image uh, I will show you better. Uh, it's a male, uh, it's a male um, figure, a character uh, enthroned uh, with a chalice and uh, the severed uh, head of a goat. And uh, this also uh, recalls another um, uh, female deity with flowers and a goat head. Uh, female from Baricot from the same period. But what is most important is that the fact that uh, this, um, um, this piece uh, closely uh, recalls another one, which, uh, which is in a private, uh, in a private collection, and um, a, a number of other small stele, uh, especially female, uh, they, the female, uh, these female goddesses, uh, which are all in uh, part two um, uh, from the Lahore Museum and Bridge Museum, others are in private collections, but in any case, they, they were all, uh, how to say, uh, dispersed uh, evidence with no uh, sure provenance. Um, some of them were. Um, uh, possibly related to SWAT, but now we have uh, finally uh, uh, a safe benchmark to, uh, uh, to reunite this uh, group of uh, stele, which evidently belong to the same ideological horizon and probably come from the same atelier, and, uh, and, and they all are a witness to uh, other beliefs which were evidently deeply embedded in the local Dadi substratum, but they were living side by side with Buddhism. Uh, other interesting evidence come from the dwelling uh, unit D, where we found another uh, small Buddhist shrine. And again, this Buddhist uh, shrine, which is to be dated to the early second century CE, uh, has uh, bird, uh, um, birth, um, the architectural decoration in stucco. And this stucco decoration uh, recalls obviously also the stucco uh, fragments of sculptures that we found in the small Buddhist sacred area, which is um, more or less contemporary. Um, and in a second, um, in a second period of this uh, of this uh, small shrine, uh, we found uh, another uh, Buddhist uh, small Buddhist tela. But this, the most uh, interesting thing is that uh, this uh, Buddhist shrine um, is just in front of another um, sacred building of uncertain nature. Uh, we do not know which kind of um, uh, destination, cultic destination, this um, this temple had. But uh, for sure, very interesting is the votive assemblage from this uh, from this building, uh, which is composed by uh, luxury objects, among which fashion wear, um, fashion wear, golden sleepwear, and uh, even an elephant uh, tusk. Other uh, Buddhist uh, small steles were, um, were found here and there, and they belong to the period eight, uh, mostly to the period uh, seven or the period eight, which means uh, between the second and the, uh, and the 
beginning of the uh, third century uh, see um, these are all the other uh, other uh, stele especially i would like to uh, call your attention on this small um, uh, figures of bodhisattvas um, i must confess uh, without the archaeological stratigraphy i would have said uh, that this stele were much uh, later and in, in fact if you uh, look at the uh, assemblage of uh, small uh, stele coming from uh, baricot and all dated uh, within the second century let's say within, within the second century see you find um, stylistic trends that without archaeological context we would have been tempted to assign to the fourth and maybe even uh, fifth century uh, CE. Uh, so this means that when we reason uh, of, uh, of about uh, Gandharan art, we uh, desperately need archaeology because archaeology um, um, yields data uh, which compel us to reason in a totally uh, different way. Uh, and I would like uh, to um, to close with this. Um, uh, with this uh, picture, uh, which is from the ongoing excavation. It means my colleagues are there and they are excavating um, an area uh, which um, was unfortunately uh, heavily plundered by uh, robbers. Uh, and, um, uh, and they found here um, very early uh, stupa, the, um, the, the earliest level they uh, reached is in the Greek, and uh, uh, which means they have uh, several uh, pieces of evidence to date. Uh, this, this, the earliest stupa to the um, to the uh, in the Greek period because they have lots of. Um, uh, ceramic finds associated and also uh, coins. Uh, but as you can see, unfortunately, uh, very often archaeology uh, is, um, uh, how to say, uh, comes across uh, this, um, the devastation made by uh, robbers. And uh, can you imagine how, how many more data we could have uh, um, uh, gained from this excavation uh, without the devastation made by illegal excavators. And uh, I would like to conclude with um, uh, uh, recalling Domenico Facenna's strategy uh, for knowledge sharing, because many, many have, uh, how to say, uh, complained um, uh, against Facenna because he didn't uh, he didn't um, uh, publish a comprehensive study of the sculptures, but this was because he was uh, first committed with providing a first uh, first a solid archaeological uh, framework as a base for any further investigation and uh, analysis and interpretation of data. And actually, he was. Uh, he started writing, uh, writing down a volume about the uh, sculptures, um, the uh, sculptures from the uh, excavations, Buddhist excavations in Swat, uh, but unfortunately, he left it unfinished. And what is more, he left several different versions, and now we are working at the completion of this. Uh, uh, of this volume, it will be a very difficult task because we have to, we have already, but we have recomposed what we think is the last version uh, of this work, and uh, this will be uh, published soon and uh, soon. I hope uh, in one year more or less, and I hope that this will be uh, a very important contribution to the. Uh, for the developments of studies about Gandharan art. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Filigenzi. Uh, this was a fascinating talk, and I think it, it, um, 
really focused on uh, some of the things that we were we were discussing yesterday about uh, what is happening in terms of Buddhism outside the the monastery. Uh, I think Mark has a question, but I have also one question uh, that I would like to ask. So, Mark, if you want to unmute uh, and join us, um, do, do you, uh, Anna, do you see a pattern in you know sort of the religious traditions outside of the monastery? Because you showed a lot of diversity, and I'm wondering whether there is a pattern in terms of whether. Um, certain traditions are localized in 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 Barikot, or are they are, are they uh, more mixed in public and more more particular in private? I'm wondering whether there is a pattern uh, to to sort of comprehend uh, the religious beliefs of the the communities that lived in in the area. Now, uh, thank you for this question because actually during the last uh, over the last years we started. Uh, deepening this kind of studies, and we started highlighting some uh, the infiltration of uh, infiltrations of this uh, local substratum also within sacred areas. And actually, from Saidu Sharif, for instance, we have uh, exactly the small stupa thirty-eight, which I um, which I uh, showed to you. Um, uh, These eight panels. Um, uh, uh, segments of uh, of frieze, a small frieze, um, uh, have on the uh, bear on the um, upper re register uh, some very interesting scenes, which are, the, to our opinion, to be connected is exactly to the same um, local substratum uh, witnessed by the uh, by the gods and goddesses with. Uh, uh, beakers and uh, severed heads of uh, goats, because this is um, uh, this has also a very ast um, astonishing. The the scenes represented in this um, in this reliefs have very uh, astonishing comparisons with the production consumption of uh, wine uh, among the kafirs of the Hindu Kush, uh, and also the this reliefs. Uh, depict uh, scenes of uh, libation, for instance. So we started connecting uh, the scenes to this oldest uh, uh, substratum, which was uh, alive. I mean, uh, right. the same people who uh, protected and supported uh, Buddhism, uh, maybe they had their own uh, festivities. And uh, during these festivities, uh, connected with the New Year, with the... Uh, uh, wine uh, with wine production of wine. Uh, they they did other things not only outside of the monasteries, but they represented also these festivities within the monasteries. Great, yeah. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thanks, Anna. A very interesting um, presentation. You can hear me, okay? Yes. 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 Okay. Fine. So, uh, two questions, which is, you showed, um, I think it was a Bukhara in one of the the later periods, the reliquary chambers, right? So were those chambers and was there a tradition of putting new reliquaries when you expanded a stupa in the layer you were in the expansion zone or did they dig into the older layers and deposit it further within the stupa? That's the first question. The other one is you showed um, in a later period in the flourishing period of expansion at one of the, I think it was the Bukhara places where uh, the, there was a dominance use of stucco. So is that sort of a, is that like a cheap way of producing images? Because obviously car, carved images take more and probably more resources. And, and or was that a tradition that was changing across Gandhara generally? So it was a whole cultural shift. Okay, as for the first question, um, no, actually this uh, reliquary recesses were um, the technique uh, shows that they were, uh, I would say, embedded in the core uh, mention. And so they were not, uh, uh, I would say, inserted in a, a pre-existent uh, building, but uh, the building was um, meant to contain these new reliquaries and as a kind of deposit. And this seems to be, actually, it's so... Um, uh, 
this emphasis on uh, deposit means that evidently the reconstruction of stupa four was a very important thing. Maybe after uh, after the disastrous earthquakes uh, and um, um, also. As for the stock, it is true that probably, especially after uh, some natural natural calamity, because SWAT is a very seismic uh, zone, and so that maybe uh, uh, a cheaper material was also attractive. But we have not to forget that uh, stock was uh, like a clay in uh, Central Asia. Uh, was also producing um, uh, producing uh, um, master chiefs, uh, masterpieces, and uh, my my opinion is that it is true that uh, stucco is a cheaper material, but it is also true that probably from Afghanistan, for instance, there were there were I have to say a, a renovating uh, wave of. Uh, the uh, aesthetical uh, novelties uh, and probably because with stucco or with uh, clay they could represent uh, colossal uh, figures they could paint them they could gild them so maybe also this uh, which is not only aesthetic uh, aesthetic reason aesthetic, but also ideological reason maybe uh, connected to some doctrinal uh, evolutions. Okay, so, great. in my opinion, there are uh, both the reasons uh, could uh, be uh, uh, could have been effective. Thanks. Thanks so much, Anna, for that fascinating talk. Uh, and Mark uh, and Ian, uh, you can uh, unmute yourself uh, and I will uh, move on to our next presentation, uh, which has uh, two presenters or two co-authors, uh, Mark Allen, uh, who did his undergraduate studies at the Australian National University of Canberra with Professor de Jong and received his PhD in Buddhist studies at the University of Cambridge in 1996 with Professor K.R. Norman as a supervisor. He's currently chair of the Department of Indian Subcontinental Studies at the University of Sydney. His primary research interests are the composition and transmission of early Buddhist literature, the ways in which texts have been used by Buddhist communities, and the Indic languages of early Buddhist texts, Bali, Gandhari, Sanskrit. He's involved in two major research projects. The first concerns the study and publication of recently discovered Gandhari Buddhist manuscripts from Afghanistan and Pakistan. And the second involves the conservation, photogra uh, photographing and study of the Kutadao Pagoda marble stele, recension of the uh, Pali Canon in Mandalay, Myanmar. He's the author of Style and Function, a study of dominant stylistic features of the prose portions of Pali canonical sutta texts and then uh, mnemonic function. Uh, also three Gandhari Ekatharika Gama type sutras, uh, British Library Kharosti fragments 12 and 14, which was published uh, in Seattle in 2001. Uh, also the composition and transmission of early Buddhist texts with specific references to sutra. Uh, produced in Bochum in 2021, and numerous articles on early Buddhist literature. I'm going to get to Ian McCrabb. Uh, he is the founder and managing director of Systemic, a Sydney-based IT consulting group. Uh, Systemic supports a portfolio of commercial and open source humanities research platforms clustered around content transformation and text analysis. Ian is the founder and director of the uh, Prakash Foundation, a nonprofit association which supports digital scholarship in Buddhist studies and Sanskritic languages. Prakash provides strategic planning and program management for platform developments. His dissertation, Buddha Bodies and the Benefits of Relic Establishment, Insights from a Digital Framework for the Analysis of Formulaic Sequences in Gandhari Relic Inscriptions, was focused on the ritual practices and religious significance of relic establishment in uh, Gandhara. So both Mark and Ian, uh, welcome to the workshop. So uh, we changed the title slightly actually to Digital Research Publication Repatriation of Gandhari 
manuscripts and inscriptions. So the last three decades of Gandharan studies, particularly of textual studies and languages and so on, has been really radically transformed, you know, and it's come a long way since the discovery of this manuscript, you know, over 100 years ago in Khotan on the southern Silk Route um, in sort of, you know, 1892, right? And this document, which is a Gandhari version of the um, Dhammapada, was... Um, the only Buddhist literary document for about 100 years, right, was definitively published by John Bruff um, in 1962. And then, you know, since then we have this, you know, a huge quantity of inscriptions on reliquaries, uh, you know, other art objects, and then, you know, uh, legends on coins, of course. Um, now, you know, since the 1990s, this, you know, particularly textual studies of Gandhara and Gandharan language studies has really been transformed. They discovery a huge quantity of manuscripts. Um, uh, Richard Solomon, who spoke the other day, I wasn't able to attend because um, it wasn't, um, so I don't know quite what he said. So I might be repeating a little bit of what Richard said, but um, hopefully not too much. But essentially, you know, in the early 90s, this the British Library manuscripts were discovered, denoted to the British uh, Library. Um, you know, uh, the project is headed by Richard Solomon. Um, he produced the overview volume of that, you know, 29 Birchbark scrolls, you know, um, approximately 23 texts um, containing things, you know, where the first to be published was the volume, of the, the first to be just, uh, published was the volume by Richard himself, a Gandhari version of the, the Rhinoceros Sutra. Um, then I published the second volume, which was, had three sutras of the Ekrotrikagama type. Um, so, you know, this, and then there's been a series of publications on those. Um, we then have another collection turned up, 24 scrolls, approximately 41 texts. This is referred to as the Robert Senior Collection. Um, and, uh, you know, again, uh, birch bark manuscripts folded like this, interred in a pot, Apparently, this collection interred in a stupa. We had them carbon dated and combined with the inscription on the pot. We put them around 130 to 140 of the, the common era. Um, they contain a whole series of sutras, discourse of the Buddha, and some biograph biographical texts, such as this one, which has you know, two stories. On one side is the story of uh, the merchants, Tapus and Balika, who give the Buddha his first meal after his awakening. Um, the other side has the, the Naga King Nilapatra. And, you know, these are very interesting. Many of these sutras have parallels in multiple languages and belong, belonging to different textual traditions. Um, you know, Gandhari now, um, Sanskrit, Pali, Chinese and Tibetan. And some of them, this collection, very interesting in that they have representations in Gandharan art, such as this story of Tapus and Balika, which is, you know, the giving of the the first meal and then the gods of the four direction giving the Buddha his the four bowls and the, the Buddha collapsing them into one. And, you know, the bowl, as we know, became an object of veneration, was apparently um, present in Gandhara. Um, and you find it on the, the pedestal of many images. You know, another example would be the second discourse of the Buddha, the Gandhari version of what's referred to as the Anattalakana Sutta, um, which I published as an article. Um, and this, you know, it's hard to tell whether this is depicted or not, but certainly the first sermon is very common, and this is the second sermon, so the whole event. Um, you know, another major collection uh, were discovered in the caves of Bamiyan, um, and this collects consists of texts both in the earlier texts, mostly in the uh, Gandhari language Kharoshthi script, such as a fragment of the uh, Mahaparinirvana Sutra that uh, Richard and I published, or, you know, later texts, mostly in Sanskrit and Brahmi script, such as the, the Lotus Sutra. So, you know, really huge uh, diversity of texts in this collection. You know, this is something that uh, Anna showed, uh, the Bajau collection found in um, the Bajau region, 1999, um, 19 Bosch scrolls, um, you know, 22 texts and so on. So, again, a great diversity of manuscripts and texts, uh, text types. Um, very interesting. And then split collection, bit miscellaneous, uh, mostly the project headed by um, Harry Falk, again, 
contains a diversity of texts. So the Gandhari, very early Gandhari version of a Prashnapada meter text. Uh, Gandhari, Dhammapada, a Dhammapada, not the Dhammapada as we tend to know it. Um, all very interesting, lots of other uh, texts within this collection as well. And then individual texts, such as a scroll that um, is at the University of Washington uh, Library, sort of scholastic treatise, um, or an individual scroll um, being published by Richard Solomon uh, at the Library of Congress. Um, and then, of course, on top of that, so that's the Gandhari language material. We have material in other languages, such as, you know, well, from Bamiyan, of course, we had you know, quite a lot of material in Sanskrit or Buddhist Sanskrit. And then we have, you know, a large collection that was found in Gilgit, apparently. It's a private collection, such as it contains a more or less complete a long discourse collection, Digagama, and then other portions of the Vinaya and so on. Um, being project headed by Uwe Hartmann at the University of Munich. And then we get Bactrian, uh, some Bactrian Buddhist texts as well. Um, yet another collection sort of surfaced, well, it had been known about a little while ago, but surfaced just recently. Um, and this is really a massive collection. It contains approximately, you know, 60, 50 to 60 scrolls, scroll fragments. Um, so, and, you know, some of us are starting to work on these such as one of the very, you know, it's really diversity of texts of, you know, representing of some of the earliest strata of Buddhist literature, such as the Atakabhaga, which we know it in the Pali form in the, the Sutta Nipata, or a Gandhari version of a chapter of the section of the Samadhi Raja Sutra, an important Mahayana text. And so this is, you know, important for many reasons, but it's certainly the oldest um, Indic version that we have, unfortunately, very fragmentary of this important text that we find in Chinese um, Tibetan. So, you know, then biography of the Buddha, unknown biography of the Buddha being edited by um, Richard Solomon again, um, uh, fragments of the Pratimoksha, which is very, you know, very interesting because uh, we don't find in the early period at least uh, manuscripts of the Vinaya, the disciplinary rules of monastics. Um, then, you know, I published this not long ago, which is very fragmentary, unfortunately, but it seems to be a ledger of donations by the um, one of the great Kushan kings, Avima Kodfaisis, to a monastery. So that's very interesting. It's a unique document, the first we have of such a document. Um, now, in terms of sheer numbers, well, Stephen Baum's published a paper in 2004, so, you know, it's now out of date. You know, and he, he talks about, you know, 89 birch bark scrolls and, you know, at least 115 distinct texts. And then that's without the Bamiyan material. Well, you know, now I think we're looking at, you know, hundreds of texts by many different scribes and, you know, a huge diversity of, um, of genres. Now, you know, to... Um, you know, the significance of these manuscripts are, are, are huge. You know, we didn't have this sort of witness apart from that one, you know, Kotan Dhammapada of, of literary, Buddhist literary texts and, and related material, you know, until now, the 90s onwards, um, you know, relevant to, you know, history of Buddhism in, in Gandhara, its transmission up into Central Asia and China, you know, the schools that, were, that, that flourished in Gandhara, development of Buddhist thought and practice, <laughs> Um, you know, the nature of the texts that were used by Buddhist communities, you know, the language, the Gandhari language and script and so on, like right? many different, and, and art historical, as you saw, some of them have relationships with art, um, art images, so this is quite interesting. Now, you know, um, despite our best efforts, most of this material remains unpublished, you know, it's just coming all the time. And there's, you know, approximately about 20 of us who are actively publishing this material. So it's a very small group, you know, expanding all the time. Um, and, you know, conventional publication takes a long time, you know, so that volume I showed you of mine from the, the British Library, you know, that took four years, time, you know, four years to, to publish it. So, you know, really huge uh, uh, corpus of material, only a few scholars actually publishing it, and that takes a long time. It's difficult, fragmentary material, right? Now, you know, we, of course, have come into the digital age, right? And this is, you know, very important. That, you know, this digital age has enabled us to develop resources to facilitate the study of Gandhari manuscripts, you know, 
and um, one of the first, uh, or the first project to develop digital resources for the study of Gandhari manuscripts, inscriptions, and, and so on, is the uh, Gandhari.org, which you may very well be familiar with, which was created by um, uh, Andrew Glass and Stefan Bountons. And now the focus of this site is on the requirements of specialist researchers. So it's, it's you know, a fantastic resource. You know, you have... Um, uh, a, a catalog, um, a dictionary, a multi ancillary resource, so other dictionaries of other languages like the Pali or access to those. And then, um, you know, the catalog, you can pull up each image and then metadata of that, right? Now, however, the, the digital also enables us to reveal new dimensions of these materials and to relay these features to scholars and the larger interested communities in ways that are could only be dreamt of in the past and to deliver them in a more timely fashion. It also enables us to um, develop what we might call, what we're referring to as digital, digital repatriation, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, now, a group of us from the University of Sydney, Australian National University, University of Washington, Seattle, Stanford, and other universities have been developing you know, a, a cutting edge de digital environment for collaborative digital research, publication, and repatriation. So that is environment in which scholars can, can work collaboratively, share material, work privately, share material, and so on, and then make that material available to ever-expanding um, communities. Um, so I will stop sharing now, and um, Ian will, will take over. Ian. Thanks for the opportunity to present today. Um, what I'll walk through is the digital frameworks that we put in place for research and publishing of Gandhari manuscripts and inscriptions, and how these frameworks are positioned in an overarching strategy of digital repatriation. Whilst I'm going to be talking about the digital, it's not going to be a technical presentation. It's really not. It's conceptual. So try and bear with me if you can. Um, so... Our digital repatriation strategy is comprised of three integrated frameworks. The core research framework supports the development of scholarly digital editions. The publishing framework frames and contextualises these editions for engagement with both the wider scholarly community and, and with interest and heritage communities. The outer ring, the governance framework, manages policy, attribution and collaboration on the range of digital artefacts and research outputs. Each framework is a complex of platforms, methods, and implementation strategies, conceived of as concentric stratum. What I'll focus on today is the inner rings, the digital research framework, and the digital publishing framework. So first, our, our digital research framework. Um, this is constituted by three platforms, read in the centre, Workbench and Site Strata, which support philological research, collaboration, and methodology for the development of corpora of digital editions. Engagement with the digital research is through our work, readworkbench.org site. The foundational component of the framework is the Read platform, and Read is a philological research and publishing engine developed since 2013 with funding from a consortium of universities. It's an open source platform for manuscript epigraph epigraphic research. The de development team was Andrew Glass and myself, Stefan Bones and Stephen White. Andrew and Stefan use Read to publish their Gandhari.org site that Mark talked about just before. And our projects are entirely complementary. We've established the collaborative research space and digital publishing framework, whilst the focus of Gandhari.org is their catalog and dictionary. So the read platform transforms text and their material context to an optimal digital structure for language research. Read imports text and image and provides the tools to develop research outputs, such as a glossary, paleography, syntactic and structural analysis. The defining innovation is the atomization of text into orthographic subunits, individual consonants and vowels. And that's quite a paradigm shift in data structure from a string of marked up text 
to a linked network of objects. And this approach enables mapping across all layers of textual analysis, from factual data, that is the location of a character on a surface, through the contestable, the transliteration of that character, to the purely interpretive, to putting on semantic annotations. And read fits in with the digital humanities milieu by supporting export in standards-based formats such as TEI. Now, if that overview was a little challenging, the takeaway is really that what we came up with was a way of shredding text into atoms so that we have the flexibility to study all the inherent structures and the applied patterns on those texts. So the next strata, Read Workbench, is a web portal that harnesses the deployment of Read to manage corpus development projects. Now, Workbench provides a range of structured workflows to support researchers in establishing their texts, in building up their analysis strata, and then collaborating across disciplines. It's a self-service workbench to support the development of individual texts and their aggregation into collections and corpora. And then the wrapping strata of all of this is our readworkbench.org site, which hosts all of the process, procedure, and standards documentation. And so this is really our entry point and our knowledge base for researchers collaborating on projects. So to pull all this together, Reed provides the core philological capability with Workbench providing the encompassing portal services and workflows, and then the outer rings correspond to the site and the methodology we've built to support projects. And all of this is hosted at the University of Sydney free of charge as software as a service. So a good question is, is what do we get from all this framework? And looked at from the perspective of outputs, the research framework supports the integration of text, image and metadata on the left-hand side of the screen and generates philological research outputs ranging from diplomatic editions to the range of standard studies through to custom analysis. The range of philological outputs are, are familiar to specialists and had previously been laboriously developed, usually largely manually, to support monographs and journal articles. The corpus outputs in the top right really support a radical reframing of the very notion of, of, of a digital corpus. We, what we're trying to do is support flexible aggregation of texts into thematic collections. So looked at from the perspective of workflows, the framework supports the entire development arc from the import of text collaboration with other researchers on the development of various studies, aggregation into collections to the generation of digital editions. And the methodology is based on the notion of a single text database as the fundamental, fundamental object of development, collaboration and portability. And then, again, this is quite a departure from the conventional corpus model where a centralised administrator manages a monolithic database. This model was designed to address some of the ubiquitous issues with conventional corpus, those of confidentiality, ownership, control, support, innovation, and standardization. Again, the, the, the circular motif is, is quite deliberate. Um, um, everything in philology, as, as those here will attest, is, is, is wearingly iterative. Um, I, I apologize if I, I deluge you with new concepts, but the summary takeaway is that the platforms and methodologies that, that we've and methodologies provide a comprehensive framework for collaborative digital philology. What I'll do now is move on to our digital publishing framework, and I'll just spend a couple of minutes to go through that. The publishing framework is constituted by the rendition, digital edition, and story map strata and supports research outputs, scholarly context, and community engagement. So the first component is what we call a rendition. And this is the foundational component that's generated from our research framework. We've worked up the capability for an editor to configure different permutations of research outputs 
and determine which facets, which scholarship they want to present to readers and how they want to present them. We've done quite a lot of work on how to present these digital renditions with a toolbar that you can see featured there with which the reader can select from a range of preset views, studies like a translation or a glossary, a script report or a Sanskrit shire. And I'll demo this in a moment. The next layer we call a digital edition. And this strata frames these embedded renditions with contextual content for scholarly digital publication. The peer reviewed digital editions are companions to conventional journal articles or monographs. These digital editions are then organised into thematic collections to provide a sophisticated user experience to filter and search for particular texts and display summaries, metadata and images. And this approach promotes engagement with the wider scholarly community outside of the small cohort of super specialists. The outermost layer, the story map strata, integrates historical cultural and repatriation narratives in a sophisticated presentation format suitable for engagement with interest communities and heritage communities amongst our partners in Pakistan, Nepal, Myanmar, Cambodia and Indonesia. The story map provides a range of immersive pathways to engage at an introductory level with collections and to drill down to scholarly editions and specialist revisions. So this strategy is one of of expanding engagement and impact. It's a little glib, but the publishing framework expands from 30 to 300 to 3,000 to 3 million. The 30 researchers, the super specialists with the command of the Gandhari language, who might engage with specialist research renditions, expands to 300 or more Buddhist philologists who might engage with these materials when framed and contextualised as digital editions. This then expands to 3,000 general scholars and students who might engage with translations and summaries in collections. And then by developing the story maps, we can radically expand to the 3 million members of the interest and heritage communities who can engage with introductory narratives. So what I'll do now is actually demonstrate some of the outputs from this so you can see these things in action. And what I'll do first of all is walk through some of the features of digital editions. I'm at our um, Gandhari Buddhist text site. Um, and what I'll do is I'll start by delving into one of these collections. Mark's mentioned the Robert Senior collection before. And when I go to the Robert Senior collection, you'll find that there's some framing content around this collection some background as to um, its significance and the origin of the collection, some bibliographic referencing, and some tabs with some more detailed information, perhaps about the dating or other, other aspects of the collection. What you'll see on the right-hand side is the growing list of digital editions from this collection that have been developed. And I'll start with the enough the Lakshana Sutra that Mark's already mentioned. When I click on this, we open up the digital edition. And again, we have framing content. We have a, a paragraph of content around um, the significance of this sutra and, and its relationship to, to the canon and, and other parallel and parallels in other canons. We again have a summary of the entire content. We have some bibliographic referencing and, and acknowledgement. So we've got some framing content that tells us about this sutra. The critical thing and the most important thing here is that we have embedded in the digital edition this rendition straight out of the, the read database. And I will bring it up full screen so it's easier to see. So this is our rendition of the Anatta Lakshana Sutra. If I click on each word in, in each word in the in the edition, ever, may, should I, you'll see that what's happening is that atomic um, relationship of a single akshara to a single syllable is represented by, as I move through the, the, the edition, you can see the actuaries on the image are highlighted. And what pops up is a translation, a Sanskrit chaya, and some um, inflection information about that word. 
So this is critical for people and, and, and really valuable in terms of um, pedagogical purposes. There's a lot of advanced features here. I won't go through them all, but you can, for example, change the style from hybrid to diplomatic to reconstructed. You can change the format from a physical layout to a structural layout. I'm not going to labour this. People, um, um, specialists who are interested in these things can go to our, the, the Gandhari, text, Gandhari Buddhist text site and have a look at this. For people who are new to this, though, there are buttons here, so I can click on a translation, for example. And what this produces for me is a translation of the text synchronised with the, the transliteration. Thus I heard, at one time the Bhagavad, etc., etc. I can click on a Chaya button. A lot of scholars read Gandhari through the Sanskrit. Evam maya shrutam, thus have I heard. Ekam samayan bhagavan, etc. Um, a lot of work from philologists goes into the glossary. And what this produces for us is a full glossary of the entire edition. So if I, if I click on a head word such as idda, this, it highlights in the text every attestation of that word. And in the glossary, it will give me all of the inflection information about that word. Um, we also have a script layout. And what that script layout does, come back to it this way. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, so last thing we could, I wanted to show you was that we can export from this both the TEI text and the plain text exports from this as well. Okay. So um, next thing I wanted to show you is another collection. I'll go into the Gandhari Relic Inscriptions collection. And this one is very close to my heart. I did my work on this, these, some of these inscriptions. Again, we have contextual information around the collection, its significance and some of the approaches that were taken to the analysis in this collection, as well as some, some bibliographic referencing. Um, we have in here as well, we have a full catalogue of these inscriptions. So here I can use what's called faceted search. I can look at all 60 of these inscriptions or I can pick the ones that are, that are done on sheets and maybe the ones that are on gold sheets. And that narrows down the list to just these ones here. So there's all sorts of facets you can search by and, and quickly find the text or the inscription that you're interested in. Um, I'll select one here. This, this time I'll select the Urasika inscription. So this is, coming at, this is coming from the perspective of a general scholar or a student. I can open up this tab and I can see a summary of this Urasika inscription. Um, there's a summary of it. In, in this case, it's a summary of, of, of its find and its material context and, and how it was found. We have here a translation of it. And within here, we have, as you'd seen before, one of those renditions where you can see the relationship of um, text to image. I can click on this tab and see the full transliteration in Gandhari and the Chaya in Sanskrit. I can click on images, zoom in and see high quality images of, of, of the uh, inscription. Um, and well, I can also go in here and link out to the full digital edition of this. Now, in this case, I won't go through all the other features, but I will show you. Um, in this case, uh, you can apply all sorts of custom um, analysis to these sorts of texts. In my case, I did work on visualisation of structures. So you can look at the semantic patterns and look at the relationship of the syntactic patterns with the semantic patterns. Now, obviously, I'm not even going to attempt to go through what the methodology is there or what the outcomes were, but really just wanted to give you a, a flavour that on top of all the basic philological research outputs, we can lay on top all sorts of custom research. Um, last thing I wanted to show you from here was the Theodotus reliquary 
famous reliquary. And the reason I wanted to demonstrate this is because we've gone the next step here and integrated a 3D model of the reliquary itself. So when this opens up, I can go in here and click on the first word, Theodutina, or the second word, Meridak, Meridakina, and the 3D model changes its camera position and its zoom position to expose that word and shows me the translation and the chaya in context there. There's lots of features here I could show you. I won't spend the time on it, but you can drive it from this direction and I can manipulate the 3D model, click on a particular word, and of course you'll see that that, that updates over here on the left-hand side as well. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to walk through is um, our story maps. So what we have here is our publishing framework supports virtual collections. So on the Anubasha side, we have an extract of the senior collection published in a very different context. In this case, the focus is on engagements, not only with the wider scholarly community, but also with interest and host communities. So what I'll, what I'll do is, is, is I'll launch this thing called a story map. And you can see that here. What I'll do is, as I just speak to this, I'll just page down through it and give you a bit of a flavor of what this story map is. So um, we developed this story map to introduce Gandharan Buddhist scrolls. The story map platform is particularly effective at narratives of place and time, of journeys and transitions. And it's widely used on news sites for long form stories. We developed this as an introduction to Buddhist texts and Gandharan scrolls and their significance. We worked with copywriters and designers so that the emphasis was on narrative flow and visual sophistication to engage with the widest possible audience. It provides a compelling narrative of the conservation and study of these manuscripts that draws a reader into a summary of the contents of particular manuscripts and then acts as an on-ramp to the catalogues and digital editions for those interested. Um, so what I'll do is I'll add a link to this to the chat in a few minutes. Thanks, Ian. Um, so the problem with traditional forms of scholarship is uh, that the wider communities, particularly the, uh, in the in this case, the communities from which these important cultural items originate, so that is in Afghanistan and Pakistan, are generally excluded from access to these items that form a part of their cultural heritage, right? So, you know, the publications are very specific. So most people in Pakistan, Afghanistan could not access them nor necessarily read them. They're very detailed. So the digital, you know, the new digital age prompts us and enables us to develop what we refer to as digital repatriation. Now, digital repatriation, as we understand it, um, aims to expand engagement with these culturally significant items with the large, the, um, that have largely been the limit of, of research specialists, right? So it expands that. Um, it uses digital technology to make these items and the scholarly knowledge, knowledge associated with them accessible to general academics, interested and host communities, right? Highly technical, textual analysis, framed and conceptualized, become interactive digital editions. Significant collections are published and presented in engaging modes for learning and general appreciation. And these can then be translated into local modern languages such as Urdu in the case of Pakistan and presented in forms that are easily accessible to non-specialist local audiences and hosted by local institutions. So in other words, we, we're working with some major institutions in Pakistan. You know, this story map could be translated into Urdu so that those communities can have access to that material. And you saw the sort of way in which an individual could interact with it. It could be also be used as a basis um, this digital material for museum displays. That is, you know, you have a, an object, but you then have an, an audio visual display, which uh, the, the participants, members, visitors to the museum can, can interact with and explore dimensions of that reliquary, whatever it is, art object that we're not, that's not very available to them normally. Um, so the flexible visual space emerging from digital repatriation are proving to be the foundation for innovative scholarly collaboration partnership 
with local universities and museums, as I just described. Could you show the last um, slide? Yeah. So we have recently been put in place a consortium agreement between the University of Sydney, Australian National University in Canberra, Prakash Foundation, um, to uh, develop support and extend the research and publishing framework and developing the repatriation strategy and other institutions uh, such as Jason Nealis in Canada, um, uh, institutions in Pakistan uh, joining um, this consortium. Um, so uh, back to you, Ian, please, to finish up. So thanks for that. Um, so just to segue a little bit, but, but given Anna, Anna Philogenzi's wonderful presentation beforehand, it's actually quite relevant. We've been developing a new initiative, we, initiative we call Inscribed Item Collections. And the impetus for this arose from the Upper Indus Project where we collaborate, collaborate with Jason Nealis and Pakistani scholars on the research and digitisation of sites where the rocks have both inscriptions and petroglyphs. There's a very famous one being um, displayed there. So we've been consulting widely with Gandharan art historians on this initiative, and it's taken on quite some momentum. The objective is to open out new avenues for cross-disciplinary research, for engagement between art historians and, and epigraphists in a digital context. So in the Buddhist, Buddhist stele displayed, the relationship between the inscription on the base and the narrative aspects of the imagery can be explored. Um, in the reliquary portrayed, the inscription is woven through the imagery on the casket. So an art historian might tag the Buddha, the halo around the Buddha head, the Ushnisha or the protuberance on the Buddha's head, and the hand gestures, for example, a philologist will analyse the inscriptions and collaborate with the art historian on the semantics of the relationships between the inscriptions and the annotated images. So the project we're looking to fund would entail the extension of our digital framework from the integration of text and 3D models to art historical analysis. We want to support the integration of image annotation with a philo philological analysis that we've demonstrated today. So we'd anticipate a, an initial pilot phase to build out the catalogues of both reliquaries and Buddha statues, to develop the annotation taxonomies and to publish digital editions of pilot reliquaries and, and Buddha statues. And this phase, phase would also include journal articles exploring both the methodological outcomes and the research outcomes, the relationships between text and image in pilot editions. Of course, the project will be framed within our digital repatriation strategy and of, of expanding engagement and be aligned with parallel projects to develop complementary story maps. So that's the conclusion of our presentation and, and really do appreciate your indulgence today. Um, I'll stop sharing and um, look forward to any questions. Thank you so much, Mark and Ian. Um, I had a question myself, but I also know that uh, Richard and uh, Osmond will be joining us and they have perhaps also a couple of questions and, and comments on, on your project, which is really a very wonderful project. Um, how do you bridge sort of the technological divide, right? Um, in, in terms of digital repatriation, uh, which is actually a, a, a great idea, but uh, having worked with uh, on digital projects in places like Sri Lanka, um, uh, you know, and, and familiar with with them in India, that there, there are uh, structural issues on the ground that often prevent access to the, these types of resources mm -hmm. on the ground in a place like Pakistan. So I'm wondering, as part of the project, um, how do you facilitate? Uh, that type of digital repatriation? Okay, so uh, a couple of ways to answer that question. The first answer, and it may not be, be direct to your, may, no, may not have been what you're asking, but the first way to answer that question is we take a consulting approach. And that's an approach that we bought from the, the, from the IT industry. And that we also take a, a software as a service approach. So that rather than expecting people in numerous different areas, whether they're in Western universities or, or in our partner universities, to be able to run and support and maintain the software themselves, we support the software from a University of Sydney server and make that available just like WordPress as software as a service. 
So that takes a lot of the technical um, constraints away, the, the threshold technical constraints are taken away. The second part of the, the, the answer is that we've built up a coterie of specialists clustered around University of Sydney, University of Washington, Australian National University, who, are, who have PhDs in Sanskrit and Gandhari, but have also trained in using these digital tools. And they act as, a cons they act upon, as, as consultants to projects. So we take that approach in terms of skills transfer when we roll out new projects. Is that kind of answering the question or is was there, there are other aspects? To it? Institutions in Pakistan, I, I'm just yeah. sort of thinking out loud, how do, how do scholars, students, PhD students in Pakistan, okay. um, yeah. you know, have access to this in, in, in uh, an equal way? Um, yeah, okay. Right. Uh, Ian, I might just answer that, um, which is that, you know, first of all, the, the material, as you see, is hosted on the University of Sydney site, and anybody can access that. It's all open, right? So, but say, for example, we're talking about uh, the story map type thing and the, you know, the translation into Urdu, right? That wouldn't obviously be hosted on our site, but nonetheless, the, the story map can be utilised by those communities, and it's not a digitally, you know, complicated challenging thing to be produced and hosted on say you know if if the a major museum in, in Pakistan I would imagine be able to do that and certainly we would be working with them to help to display that. Ian did That's you want to add right. something? Yeah no there was one just a, a brief way to answer that is that fundamental to our strategy is that we is that there is the research framework there's also the publishing framework so everything that you've seen today can simply be picked up and hosted on somebody else's website. Mm -hmm. So the entire thing can be hosted on the Islamabad Museum website. And that's a very straightforward thing to do. That's just a WordPress plugin. So it's a very simple thing for them to host all the publishing, the research outputs on, on, on their own platforms and, and take custodianship of those things. Okay, thank you. Um, Sky, can you uh, beam up the room so we can... Uh, I know it's very small over there. There you are. Uh, for questions from uh, the panelists who were uh, present yesterday. Hi, Mark. Hi, Ian. Good to see Hello. you. Yeah, I was in France when I spoke to you last, and we are at Berkeley now. Just to give you an idea, in this hall, we have Franck Billy, and then we have John Guy, and uh, uh, Selena Otavio, and then Laura Giuliano, and Richard Salomon. Uh -huh. So we had a, a wonderful session yesterday. Richard presented the manuscripts and we discussed about the interest of these manuscripts, which completely revolutionized our knowledge. Uh, before I uh, start with that, I just want to say hello to my colleagues. It should be one o'clock in the morning in Europe. Uh, my two French colleagues are No and France. Uh, I mean, today we did ask questions because we wanted to give the priority to the auditors who are joining us in Zoom. And also to my dear friend Anna, who gave a wonderful, uh, I mean, overview of Italian excavations. And I say hello to Koizumi Zan, who is in Japan now. Um, the interest here, I mean, of course, um, the work done by uh, the Bohum Museum, uh, Bohum uh, um, uh, University with Jesse Pons and also Serena here, digitizing uh, sculptures, starting with Chakdara Museum in Pakistan. Uh, which will be a wonderful, wonderful program in the future. We discussed about it. And also there are some other uh, digital programs coming up in India now to digitize uh, the uh, museum collections in um, you know, New Delhi, uh, Chandigarh, Calcutta, and other places. So when you spoke to me about this project, I mean, as Sanjot very clearly said, you are opening up all these fabulous manuscripts to the world. So, I mean, now you are in Australia, we are in, uh, we are, we are in uh, Berkeley and others are in Europe. So it's exactly the same atmosphere. The question that Sanjot asked is that uh, we are very concerned about um, um, Pakistani scholars. There are PhD students who would like to have access to this material. And as you said, there will be access to it. So that's, the, that's a very positive thing. Um, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, Congratulations, wonderful work, please continue. Um, I just wanted to ask you, 
uh, this type of program uh, would need enormous amount of funding, right? So, um, uh, and this should go on for years and years. Uh, perhaps I won't be there to see the end. But, um, uh, but so I just wanted to ask both of you, um, uh, how do you manage this, kind, this type of huge uh, task? What sort of fundings do you get? And, uh, and I'll be talking about your project as well in another, I mean, uh, one week time, I'll be giving this Habib annual uh, lecture at, uh, in, uh, at Berkeley. So I'll be talking about various digital programs and we're certainly going to talk about it because I felt the importance of it. So just this is my question. I'm sorry, Richard will uh, take more, <laughs> more, ask more questions for is here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Osman. I'll just quickly say something in Ian can, which is, of course, as with all, you know, people working in the humanities, we're always looking for different sources of funding. You know, there's, there's government funding, major grants, the Australian Research Council, European funding, and so on. Depends what we can tap into. You know, Richard Solomon has been successful with NEH grants in, in America. Um, but also, I've been working a lot with private donors and and uh, for other projects actually for doing this. So it's whatever source is 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 available for the for what you have seen that development. Most of that has been developed on the basis of funding from my personal research or um, funding or uh, Prakash Foundation, uh, you know, which headed by Ian and and just our own sheer effort. But obviously now to do. Uh, what we're looking at, which is the development of the corpus of inscribed Buddha images, um, which we're working, and and uh, reliquary inscriptions, you know, as you saw the image that Ian showed, we're looking for funding for that. So, um, you know, particularly private funding. Yeah. Yeah. That's a little bit, if I may. Um, Osman, we, uh, Mark mentioned the consortium that we formed. We formed a consortium with University of Sydney, Australian National University, Prakash, and that's being extended to... Um, Jason Nealis' university will be expend, extended to an up, a couple of other universities. That consortium provides the institutional basis for the ongoing sustainability of the platform. So um, we have made that move from uh, getting individual funding from different, from different grants to, to having an institutional basis to support it. Um, based on that consortium, then projects that want to develop their catalogs or their, 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 their digital outputs or digital collections with the platform provide some sort of contribution to, to contribute to the ongoing maintenance and support of the platform. But as Mark, I think Mark alluded to, the major funding that we need going forward is to actually support the addition of new collections. And that's where, and that, that way the, the funding can be focused on a project basis with perhaps only 20% of the funding earmarked for the ongoing maintenance and support of the platform. The heavy lifting in terms of building the, the digital infrastructure has largely been done. Yep. Well, I just wanted to thank both of you for a really interesting presentation. I'm very sorry that you couldn't be here with us physically. Uh, it occurred to me, Mark, as I was thinking about the history of all this, I think it's now 25 years that we've been working together on this. Yeah. Uh, which yep. is, how did that happen? <laughs> well, it's also a long way from when we worked on little black and white photos of the British Library collection. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, there were, yeah. <laughs> and there were three or four of us at the beginning, yeah, that's you, right. me, and Pollitt and Tim, and yep. now you estimated, I don't know, was it 20 or 30? At least people? 20 publishing, I think, yeah. yeah. So, you know, this has grown. Um, but I, I wanted to just kind of second and applaud your uh, ideas about opening opening everything up and particularly in the form of digital uh, repatriation. Uh, by the way, uh, Muhammad Hamid was here until today. He was in our group, but he couldn't uh, stay today. And I think you've already been in touch with him at the uh, yes. University of Punjab. Uh, and I spoke to him about his ideas and what you had spoken to about him. Uh, and I think that's a great thing. Um, digital repatriation is a way that, well, frankly, we didn't used to think in those terms, but that's the way the world is now. Uh, and it's great that you're working on that and opening up to that. And Hamid's yeah. comments were very encouraging to me. 
Um, I, I wanted to also mention, you know this, but I want to say it and put it on the table. Uh, we're thinking, we're paying a lot more attention to communication with and uh, communication to Asian Buddhist countries and countries of origin, that is Pakistan, Afghanistan. Um, another, another very important part of the whole picture, as you know well, is uh, non-Asian Buddhist communities. Uh, choosing my words carefully, I could say Euro-American, but then I would be leaving out Australia. So I decided to say non-Asian Buddhist communities. And uh, as you know, we've had over the years, uh, various kinds of interactions and some very helpful and mutually beneficial relationships with uh, those communities and organizations. Yes. Uh, so I just wanted to put that on the table and inform or remind everyone that that's another very important uh, audience. Yeah, thanks, Rich. And I think that, you know, in, in the, the, the resources that Ian was showing where you know, the this, you know, everybody's in the digital world. I mean, even, you know, in villages in Pakistan and, and, and India, generally now people have access to the internet, or it's very common, is that um, you know, although we have, you know, fantastic scholars in in Pakistan working on, you know, archaeology, art history, and so on. There's very few, to my not no, my knowledge, who can do what you and I do with publishing this material. And what I see with this is that it's a way by which, you know, scholars in Pakistan can actually, you know, with the ling linguistic skills, skills start to learn this material. And as you know, Jason Nealis and I were visiting Kaidazam University in Islamabad a little while ago and we're talking about setting up a, a Sanskrit and Gandhari program. That is where we are, you know, this part of re repatriation in a way, it's, it's, it's training local scholars to access their own history. That's a, that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hamid had some very interesting comments about that. Okay. Uh, that idea of re how Pakistan had gotten separated or separated itself from its pre Islamic past. Yes. And now I get the impression from what he tells me that there's a swing in the mood and that people want to uh, reclaim that past. I, I understand that and, too. And we definitely should be involved in this. And, as, I mean, that was really your idea. I'm just endorsing yeah. it. Good, thanks. Translation of that story map into Urdu for access via a mobile phone is is on our is well is well on our agenda. Yeah. Right. You know, thank you, Ian. Thank you, Mark, uh, for your presentation. Uh, thanks for joining us. Yes. Um, gives me great pleasure to introduce our our final speaker, Yoshihide Koizumi who is the Executive Vice Director of Kyushu National Museum in Japan. Uh, he completed his master's degree at Waseda University in Japan. And in 1988, he started to work at the Department of Oriental Antiquities of Tokyo National Museum, uh, an institution which commenced archeological surveys in Pakistan in 1992, in which he participated. As a curator, he was in charge of various exhibitions of Asian art, um, he worked on exhibitions uh, of Indonesian material in 1997, um, uh, exhibitions on China, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, uh, and Afghanistan and Thailand. Um, he moved to Kyushu uh, National Museum um, in, in 2009. Um, went back to Tokyo in 2013 and moved again back again to Kyushu in 2015, where he has uh, been until now. Uh, and in recent years, he has been focusing on the management of the museum uh, and also on disaster prevention work for cultural properties uh, in, in Japan. Uh, today, he's going to share with us uh, his thoughts on the excavation of Zarderi, um, so please, uh, uh, Yoshida, welcome uh, to this uh, workshop, and thank you for your patience. Thank you. So this is Koizumi from Kyushu National Museum. Today, I will make my presentation on the web. I'm now in Fukuoka, Japan. It's morning, uh, about nine o'clock. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to make a presentation today. I'd like to thank Professor Bopearachi and all those involved in the seminar. 
I've been in Kyushu for the last 10 years, but when I was working in Tokyo National Museum, I had a chance to participate in archaeological survey in Pakistan, as now so introduced. So today, uh, I'd like to introduce the excavation of Zal Deli, which was the main activity of our mission. First of all, I will talk about the brief history of archaeological surveys in Pakistan conducted by the Japanese teams. The first one was from Kyoto University. They carried out a survey of Buddhist sites in various parts of Kandara. It was mainly in the 1960s, the same as the Italian mission. Uh, for example, uh, Mehasanda, Tareri, Ichanakaderi, etc. After that, uh, in the 1980s, the same Kyoto University mission excavated running ato. And after the excavation, they worked for the restoration program of the site over the years. So Tokyo National Museum mission started research work in Pakistan from 1992. We continued field survey until 1999. Surveyed area was the Hazara Division in the Northwest Frontier Province at that time, uh, present Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. The center of ancient Gandhara was on the west side of the river Indus. It is around Maldan and Peshawar. On the other hand, Hazara Division is located on the eastern side of the river Indus, where the current Karakoram Highway heads north to China. Archaeological surveys in Hazara Division date back to the time when British Empire ruled India. In uh, 1922 to 23, Harold Hargreaves of the Archaeological Survey of India conducted a survey of this area. He left a brief report on Zal Delhi. According to his report, the site was called Zaro Delhi or Zal Ki Delhi and there was a big stupa with a circular base about 50 meters in diameter. Our research was after 70 years from his report. We initially aimed to make a distribution map of the archaeological sites in this area. We spent first three years to make it until 1994. In Zaldeli, a preliminary survey was carried out in 94 and an archaeological excavation was conducted from 95 to 99. So here is a photo of the site. You can see the stupa in the center. The site is privately owned and used as a field for the cultivation of corn and wheat. During our survey, agricultural production was not possible, so crop compensation for landowners were also required. After the survey was completed, the land had to be returned to the original state for the cultivation of them. The, this photo is an aerial view of the site. In the preliminary survey in 1994, we grasped the scale of the site, made a measurement and drew a plan as shown in the figure on the left. Our archaeological survey was conducted from autumn to winter every year. We spent one month on site and one more month making the report of the year and stayed in Pakistan for a total of two months every year. Many workers were required at the time of ex excavation. We hired a local farmer as a worker. Zaldeli is located on the south side of the Kalakorung mountain range along the Shiran River, one of the tributaries of River Indus. There is a village called Shinkyari to the south of the site. The site is located on the border between flat and mountainous areas. This land is a gentle slope from northeast to southwest, so large-scale civil engineering work was carried out to secure horizontal land for the construction of the temple. 
The scale of the temple is more than 120 meter north south and about 85 meter east west. The, there is a stupa area in the south and the monastery area in the north. Mm. Here and here. Since the time for the excavation was limited, we decided to take the trench excavation and partial excavation instead of the full excavation of the entire site. This is to get as much information as possible with a minimum of time and effort. The surveyed area from 95 to 99 is shown in this slide. The black area is an excavated area. <clears throat> So this thread shows the main stupa and the four-sided monastery. The main stupa is built in the center of a square platform of, of about 70 meters square. Hargreaves once described the base of the main stupa as a circle, but our research revealed that the plan of the main stupa is a cruciform plan with stairs in four directions. This right. The main stupa has a square plinth with a width of 24.8 meter and a staircase with a length of 10.4 meter. The height of the plinth is 5.9 meter. A drum with a uh, diameter of 18.6 meter and a dome uh, with a diameter of 15.4 meter are placed on top of it. As you can see in the photo, the upper portion of the stupa is broken and missing. This is the southeastern side of the stupa. The masonry on the side wall of the plains is exposed. It is a diaper masonry that is common in Gandharan architecture. It is a combination of block-shaped granite and a plate-shaped thin cyst, which was popular around the Kushan period. <clears throat> there are pilasters on the wall of the plinth, here and here. This is also common in Gandhara. Unlike the material of diaper masonry, the stone is a porous limestone called kanju in the local name. This stone is soft and easy for shaping Originally, the surface of the wall was covered with plaster. We investigated the eastern stairs that seems to be well preserved. There were a few stepping stones left near the bottom. Please see the side stone at the bottom end of the stairs. There is a stone with a heart-shaped hollow in, on the right side. It is a very simple design, but similar stone of the same size with relief had been found in Gandhara. As you can see on this slide, there is a feast of men and women. Buddhist temple is originally a holy place, but many of those, these circular, scene, uh, circular scenes were represented in the temple. In one opinion, it shows the images of the pure land as a paradise. On both sides of this feast scene, there are legs of beasts like lion. The shape of the panel is constricted. It seems that the heart-shaped design of Zaruderi was abstracted from such a beast foot and changed to a heart-shaped design. Next is the top of the plinth. We investigated the northwest side. As you can see, the floor was covered with schist stone slabs. Fragments of schist were uh, sprinkled before placing the slab, and soil was used to adjust the level to place the slab horizontally. A cylindrical drum is placed on the plinth, and a hemispherical dome is placed on top of it. 
Visitors of the temple should worship the stupa clockwise. Large stupas sometimes have a passage for worshiping above the twins. This stupa also might have had a passage here. However, the widths is only 1.6 meter. It is pretty narrow. So far, we are not sure it was used for passage or not. <clears throat> On the upper surface of this drum, there are traces of masonry that is running straight and parallel to the stairs. This, this, this. Straight lines can be seen in three directions in the south, east, and west. This will be discussed later. We made a conjectural plan of the main stupa. It is based on the uh, structure of other temples and the represent representation of the stupa on stone reliefs. Next, uh, those who are studying ancient Indian art would know about the enlargement of the stupa. Uh, so the previous presentation, uh, Professor uh, Firi Genji he stated. <coughs> Uh, building a, a large stupa to cover the original one was an act of charity. The photo shows the enlargement of the stupa at the Kunara site in Takshira. A huge stupa was built to cover the small core stupa. Was the stupa enlarged in Zaldiri? The easiest way to find out the traces is, is to cut the stupa like a round cake but that means the destruction of the stupa. In our excavation, we decided not to take that way because of the difficulty of the subsequent uh, conservation measures. We selected to look for clues uh, of enlargement by tracing the construction process of the huge platform of the stupa area. This slide shows a cross section of the stupa area. Under the planes of the main stupa, uh, foundation of rough diaper masonry with a depth of 3.7 meter was built. This is photo. What about masonry of the outer wall of the platform in the stupa area? As you can see, a retaining wall with a height of nearly seven meter has been built was the construction, construction of the foundation of the stupa and the work of the outer wall done at the same time. The cross section, uh, this view of the platform clearly shows the process of filling the soil on the south side of the stupa. This illustration. First, the foundation of stupa was made and the soil was filled up to cover it. Here. You can see that the soil near the retaining wall was thrown in many times, so we can see the many layers. Probably piling up stones and filling the soil were done altern <coughs> alternately. From the observation of the section, it can be judged that the construction of the foundation and the platform was carried out as a series of work. Both the plan of foundation and the planes matches each other. The plan matches each other. Through our survey, the existence of core stupa has not been confirmed. If there was a small stupa here, it would have been uh, buried in the foundation. Looking at the situation of large scale foundation work, we presume that the existence of the core stupa in the same place is unlikely. <clears throat> there is a large staircase on the south side of the platform. This was no doubt the main entrance to the temple. The center of the staircase and the main stupa are on the straight line. On the west side of the stupa area, we found uh, three structural remains. 
the this this the upper part of has been lost and it is it is not clear what kind of buildings they were however these seems to be different in shape from the small stupa The right side of this slide shows the plan of Bamara site in Takshira. In Bamara, there are many small stupas, so-called votive stupa, around the main stupa. We can find many cases that the main stupa is surrounded by many small stupas in Kandala uh, temples, including Swat area. Uh, however, the existence of votive stupas had not been confirmed at Zalteri. Uh, as is shown in the photo, three curved stone slabs were found on the southwest side of the main stupa. It seemed that they were damped. It is notable these slabs have Karushki inscriptions. This will be discussed later. <laughs> there are several examples of cross-shaped plan stupas in Gandhara, such as Shajiki Deri, Saribarol, and Bamara in Takshira, now on the slide. Generally, a cursive form of plan is considered to be newer than the square plan. Bamara stupa had seated Buddha figure enshrined on the base. Due to the architectural features such as semi ashura masonry uh, of the later period and the existence of Buddha figure, the stupa was believed to have been built in the 4th or 5th centuries. We think that the construction of the Rudiri stupa was earlier than Bamara. The next, I will talk about the monastery area in Zaludeli, the stupa and the monastery area are adjacent north and south. On the east half of the monastery area, there is a four-sided monastery with a courtyard here. Traces of structural remains can be seen on the west side of the area, but it could not be investigated because modern houses were built, as you can see on the photo. <clears throat> This is a conjectural plan of four-sided monks' cells. Due to the part, uh, partial excavation, we need, need to speculate on the whole figure. Probably a total of 41 cells were lined up facing the courtyard. Here is entrance. <clears throat> In cell uh, I6 of the east side, three iron nails with washers were found. This one, this. From this, we know that there was a wooden door at the entrance. The temple must have been abandoned with the door closed. The wood rotted and became soil. Only the nails remained in the original position. At the southeast corner of the courtyard, uh, there was a square uh, protrusion that can be seen in <laughs> other temples too. This is considered a bathing place at Jorian side in Takshira. Walls were made on the protrusion, but in the case of Zardeli, there was no partition by a stone wall, only flat uh, place. We found five rooms in the courtyard. This is an irregular format as monastic quadrangle. We suspected that the five rooms in the courtyard and the surrounding cells were built at different times, but we couldn't find any clear indication of the time difference. It is very unique. This is the small stairs attached in the courtyard. This uh, stepping stone in the red circle, this one, was reused 
It is the same type as carved stone slab with the Karovsky inscription found in the stupa area. This one. This slab also has Karovsky inscription. Reuse of the stone suggests that there are several different phases in the construction of the temple. In addition, it is likely that the construction of this monastery and the main stupa were a series of work. The next is the cell on the north side. The most important discovery in the excavation was from the northern cell. <clears throat> cell F2 is about three times three meters square, the same size as other cells. Here, here. As we removed the soil from above, the stone relief representing the seated monk was exposed near the south wall. This one. After that, the soil was carefully removed. During the work, we set a stick to prevent the wall from collapsing. This photo also shows the safety measures. We installed electricity from near house and turned it uh, on uh, through, the through the night. Moreover, we placed hard working watchdog. After daily work, we covered the room with simple roof to prevent rain and closed the door entrance. From cell F2, not only stone reliefs, but also earthenware and iron objects were found. These are the terracotta lamps and the tile from this room. At the entrance to cell F2, we got some clues about the age of the temple. As shown in the photo, carbonized wood was found on the floor outside at the entrance. Since it was used as an element of structure, it must be closely related to the age of structure here. So we collected small fragments of it and examined by radiocarbon dating. The result was a 95% chance from BC 100 to 140 AD, with a 68% chance of BC 40 to 90 AD. This data suggests that the four-sided monastery was built in the first century or relatively early Kushan period. These photos show the cell F2 after removing the soil. A total of 137 stone sculptures and materials were excavated. Looking at the arrangement of the pieces in the cell, it was categorized by the same type and properly stored. Where were a large number of sculptures originally installed in the temple? Some clues to think about the placement were left in some works. These are rubbing of Karoshti characters engraved on pilaster. As shown in the photo on the left, there are two types of capitals, the Corinthian type and the Persepolis type. One or two letters are engraved on the edge. This, this. Next is a square panel showing the seated Buddha and worshippers. Karoshti letter is engraved in the lower right, but in the leftmost, la, uh, the letter is lying down. We have categorized the square panel and the uh, pilaster into five or six groups according to the iconography of the relief and the writing style of the letters, respectively. For example, uh, in group A, a one character uh, is in the lower right corner and the uh, character is turned sideways. The group D, uh, sorry, uh, group A, this and this. 
the group D of the square panel and group D and E of the uh, pilaster have two letters on the le uh, left hand side. This, this, and this, this, and this, this. The lower part of this slide shows <coughs> the result of the class classification and the placement according to the rules by Arapachana syllabary, which uh, Professor Richard Salomon of the University of Washington clarified. Uh, this is uh, something like alphabetical order. In addition to the placement given by the order of the letters, we checked the position and the shape of tenon and the motifs of each piece and try to fit them to proper combination. As a result, a large trefoil arch has been formed. We called it group A. This huge arch is with a dip, uh, width of 3.2 meter and an estimated height of 4 meter or more. There is a gap between the top and the bottom here. The angle of protruding portion of lower part is slightly tilted inwardly. And part of the same uh, iconographic type on the upper side must be connected in a straight line. Here, here. In addition to missing pieces to connect upper and lower portions, there are many blanks. Surprisingly, we found a piece of upper left this one at Antique Market in Tokyo. Uh, before that, it was in New York. Uh, it indicates that some pieces were stored in other places. This is the group B. The group B has nothing for upper portions. We don't know they have been lost or haven't been made yet. The group B has some interesting feature from the iconographic point of view. In the center is roofed Vihara. To the light of Vihara, Bodhisattva uh, with Tavan is standing. And to the left is a Bodhisattva with water pot in his hand. Perhaps this is a combination of Avalokiteshvara and Maitreya. However, there is no Buddha in the center. In this regard, the study of Kurt Berendt of Metropolitan Museum is very helpful for us, who stated that the Buddha's relics enshrined in the Vihara would have been worshipped. Uh, this photo shows the worship of the Vihara. Looking for a proper position in the temple where such a large set of panels could be placed, it was probably on the main stupa. Please remember the straight masonry on the top of the drum I explained earlier. The photo on the left is one of the most famous stupas in Gandhara art. It was uh, from Rorian Tango, now in the Indian Museum, Kolkata. It has a trefoil false gable in the front, probably the set of panels of Zarudeli were also installed in this way. The Roliantanga stupa has a trefoil section only on the front side, but the Zarudeli's findings has a, at least two sets of trefoil panel of the same size. The possibility that the works of group A and B were replaced in one place cannot be completely ruled out, but it is possible to think that there may have been trefoil arch on each side of stupa by the traces of straight masonry on three sides of main stupa. Next, I will tell the style of stone reliefs. The style of Zarudeli work is similar to that of Butokara one in Swat. So now, so some slides were shown by the Professor Figenji. <clears throat> For example, please look at these works. The group of uh, people on the lower left is very similar to the figures of Vutokala. However, the Buddha image on the upper left 
is more stylized than Butto Kara. Regarding this relief of Butto Kara I, Domenico Facena of Italy he gave the age of the first century AD. The Alderi's work is similar to Butto Kara, but a bit more stylized, so that it seems to have been produced a little later than Butto Kara I. One more noteworthy point about Zarudiri's sculpture is the representation of Chakrabarti. This is part of group A. The central figure uh, on a four-headed carriage with an umbrella is the ideal king of India, Chakrabarti. Seven treasures of the king represented above him proves the identification, that is, Wheel, elephant, horse, jewelry, woman, minister, and soldier. The representation of both kings and seven treasures is known in ancient South India, such as Jagayapeta. In Gandhara, although there are some examples of Chakrabarti, but the seven treasures have not been found so far. This is currently the only one example. The panels of group A lack the upper central part, but it might represent the descent from the Triastrim Saheben, one of the Buddha's life story. The story is that Buddha, who ascended to Triastrim Saheben to preach to his deceased mother, landed in Sankisa at the request of the people on earth and was greeted by Chakrabarti and others. The Victoria uh, and Albert Museum collection shows the same scene with similarity in composition and uh, icon <coughs> iconography of two Zarudeli. In the Bui and A's work, uh, there is a king riding a carriage, but the seven treasures are not represented. Finally, I will mention the curved stone slabs. Among five slabs, uh, there are inscriptions on the floor. The contents of the inscription are two types. The reading was done by Professor Richard Salomon. First one is read, uh, Kesari Banami, maybe my pronunciation is not correct. Uh, the meaning is in the forest of Kesari. This phrase was also engraved uh, on the slab from the monastery, and we totally found three slabs with the same inscription. Kesari means lion. It is the symbol of the Buddhism as well as Buddha himself. Bana means the forest. It indicates Buddhist temple. Professor Salomon Samai that uh, Kesari Bana is the ancient name of this temple. Another inscription uh, is read Boilea Safarana. This is uh, interpreted of Boilea of the Faras, and the name of the person is determined to be of Iranian origin. <clears throat> Dr. Salomon says that the style of some letters shows the characteristic of an early period. On the other hand, uh, other inscriptions have those of later period, but the slabs shown here are considered to be around the first century AD. Now I have talked about the archaeological excavation of Zarudeli. To summarize uh, what I said today, 1.1 1. 1, main stupa, nothing has been found to indicate the enlargement and cruciform plan is similar to Bamala stupa so it indicates the later period. Uh, two, Karushti inscription. The text uh, Kesari Banami uh, indicates the name of the original temple. The style of the letter suggests an early Kushan period. Three, cell F2. A radiocarbon dating of the charred wood at the entrance indicates the age around the first century four stone reliefs <coughs> discovered from cell F2. So we reproduced the trefoil arch 
style of the representation. A representation is like uh, Butokara 1, so it means Ari Kushan period. Stylized modeling shows the work of the later period. So that is the outline of our excavation. So we see the elements from early to late Kushan period, which is the flourishing period of Gandhara art. These indicate that the temple has survived for a period of time. It is not enough to trace the history of the temple clearly, but we hope that new findings and knowledge lead us further understanding of Gandhara art in the future. So thank you very much for listening. That's all. Thank you so much uh, for this wonderful uh, insight into uh, this very special monument. Um, given the, the things that you referenced, uh, I would like to beam into the room once again uh, to Professor Solomon and uh, Professor Osman Boperachi because there were a couple of things uh, there I think that they are intimately uh, familiar with or could, could comment on. So um, I open up the the floor. Okay, so Koizumi-san, I'm very happy to hear your lecture and I, I have very happy memories when we worked together in Tokyo on, on this material. I don't remember when it was, but a, a <laughs> long time ago. Uh, so thank you. I wanted to add one thing, something that I didn't, we didn't know then, but uh, I found out later, is that apparently at the Barhut Stupa, there was a similar uh, system of marking position of the pieces on the upper balustrade on the, uh, I think it's the Eastern gate. Um, but all the, the only information that I have is there are just a few notes in Cunningham's report and very vague, but he draws the letters and it's clear from where they are that they must have been location markers. So I think if it were possible to take the Barhut Stupa apart, I mean, in, in the Calcutta Museum, uh, I think it would be possible to reconstruct it in a more accurate way, but I, I don't think that'll ever be possible to do that. <laughs> Just as a postscript to our work. Thank you very much. So actually, so the, the Botib Stupa uh, Calcutta Museum, so that is, so the present uh, position is not correct. Uh, somebody was uh, Professor Berent. And yeah. so anyway, so we have to find uh, other traces uh, to identify the position, the proper position. And uh, so today, so I didn't say uh, all the thing, but uh, so other uh, information uh, to decide the position uh, is uh, were found uh, from Zaru Delhi. Uh, so if so, somebody interested in in such type of inscription, so please uh, see our report uh, published in uh, 2011. Uh, so I'm afraid it is uh, very difficult to <laughs> see in the United States or other countries. But uh, so yesterday I checked uh, the museum shop of Tokyo National Museum. It is also available. Uh, but uh, so if you want to buy the report, uh, you need to use Japanese from the museum shop. Uh, maybe so you can uh, get this. Uh, this one is the report. Can I just add one thing uh, about the, the Barhut the balustrade? I, I looked at that carefully and there's one arrangement shown in one of the plates in Cunningham and a different arrangement in another page in Cunningham's book. And then the arrangement in the Calcutta Museum is different from both of those. So it's clearly just been guesswork. But if we could just persuade the museum to take it apart and let us put it together, not likely. Mm, actually, so I didn't see the, the Cunningham so, so information. So what? can I do now? N nothing we can do. <laughs> <laughs> nothing except we can go to Calcutta and ask them to uh, disassemble the, the uh, ah, yes. doctrine, <laughs> let us put it back together the right way. Mm -hmm. I see. That's okay. my dream. I see. I will check. And, mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, so after COVID-19, so... so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
We'll meet in Calcutta. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, there's one. Yeah, go ahead, Osman. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's good to I see you. Very much. Yeah. yeah long time very, good, very good to see you. I thought, as um, Sir Richard said, we would have loved to have you here, but because of the COVID, you couldn't come. But at least I can see your face after about five years. You have been very helpful to us. Uh, I mean, seeing most of the collections in Japan. Um, so, the, of course, all of us know, and fortunately, I have got the reports you gave to me, the English version of the report. So, I almost know by heart what you have found, how you proceeded and all that. I just wanted to make a comment, as Richard said, about the Varu Stupa. You know, the, the Stupa that I published in my recent book, West Met East, the main inscription was read by Harry Falk and read later by, by Richard Solomon. Uh, the donative inscription. So it didn't come from a legal excavation, but unfortunately, we know how it was found. But um, it was assembled by the dealers in a very wrong way. I just followed the Richards method and we could get a chronological order, a sequential order for the stupa. The other important factor is that the, the one that you showed where you have uh, you know, in the middle, it's like a relic chamber. On either side, you have Maitreya and most probably Alukuteshara. The same identical uh, iconography is represented in the Bunir Stupa. And also your analysis of the stylistic features comparing with Butkara number one and also uh, uh, Sardiri and also the Bunir Stupa, they are almost the same period. I mean, I totally don't agree with Pachena's uh, 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 chronology, but this, these are absolutely the earliest phase of Gandharan art. And so we need to look very carefully about the, about the numerals and also about the stylistic features. So what Sardiri did was it really opened our eyes. So we have some, um, you know, the repertoire of Gandharan art we know something about Takshila, we know about Taktibai, Mardan, Saribalor, Peshawar area, and then we have Butkara, and then we go to the east with Sarderi. So we get a very clear pattern of stylistic uh, um, uh, features of Kandaran art on which that Jessie Pons uh, worked on her thesis. So I just wanted to congratulate you and also the Japanese team and also for Richard, uh, so solving many of the problems. And as far as iconography is concerned, you know, now many art historians are interested in Sardari. So the contribution that you have made is enormous. And the, the, the fabulous thing is that you found these rooms. If you didn't have the, um, um, you know, the curiosity of an archaeologist to go into these rooms and finding what was removed from the stupa inside, is, I mean, it, the Definitely. smugglers would have found them, but not by the archaeologists. So I really wanted to congratulate you, uh, Kozi Mizan, and also your Japanese colleague and your Pakistani uh, the collaborators. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So actually, so during the excavation, so we were also uh, wondering, so which type of uh, influence uh, from Suat area, from Gandhara Center area, because uh, the style itself is very similar to Suat, uh, not in center of Gandhara, like Saribarol and other famous sites. But uh, the shape of the stupa is uh, not circular one, not square one, but uh, so with the stairs whole side. Uh, this is uh, kind of uh, center of Gandhara and Takshira area and some other uh, in like uh, Afghanistan and other areas. It is very so developed one. So actually, so the, the uh, style of the sculpture look like early time, but uh, a little bit stylized. So, and so it, it is uh, early Christian or middle Christian or late Christian. So actually, so, at first, we found these sculptures. Ah, this belonged to the late period, the third, fourth century, stylized object. But uh, so after 
the completion of the excavation, so we checked uh, other works like Italian mission and uh, Facena's achievement. Uh, so we cannot deny uh, their uh, result. And so, so far, uh, information uh, indicate uh, this belong to early or middle period. But uh, maybe so some more information like uh, other area, Brunel, uh, which you are saying, uh, should be uh, compared uh, in whole uh, area. And so we need to analyze uh, the style uh, comprehensively. And, and, and one more important thing is, uh, so to the previous meeting, uh, uh, so to access the, the Pakistani archaeologists, uh, so it is uh, one of the points, uh, so we made excavation uh, with the collaboration of Pakistani mission. But uh, so now the so Pakistani mission is very uh, aggressive to make excavation their own site. So I hope so it will uh, give much information uh, uh, about the chronology of Gandharan art, especially uh, the architecture and uh, the sculpture. Uh, so this will help uh, the further study of uh, our research. Yeah, absolutely. Thank right. Thank you, Koizumi-san, uh, for, you. Uh, for your uh, presentation. Um, I think it's been a wonderful experience, a uh, wonderful three days. I know some of you couldn't take in all uh, the presentations, but again, they will be online, so uh, you will be able to access them at a later date. Uh, I think... Um, it was a very successful uh, meeting, uh, half virtual and half uh, in person. Um, so I want to thank all the speakers for their uh, willingness to participate, for sharing their research, uh, and also for giving us so much uh, food for thought uh, and to think uh, more carefully also about our own research objectives and, and what we can do uh, as, our, as our next steps. Uh, so um, I wanna thank our audience uh, for uh, uh, staying the course over three days. And I hope that uh, fingers crossed, um, we will see um, uh, if not a complete end to the pandemic, uh, uh, a situation where we will be able to uh, for the most part, uh, return to, to regular life and, and uh, have these types of meetings again uh, on, a, on a regular basis, uh, either here or in Europe or in Asia. Um, it would be wonderful to continue uh, these types of, of collaborations and uh, the sharing of, of information. Uh, so I want to thank everybody uh, from the bottom of my heart uh, for, for, for participating. Um, and thanks to the audience and thanks to all the people who worked behind the um, scenes to, to make this uh, event uh, successful. Uh, Frank B.A., uh, as I mentioned them before, Frank B.A., uh, Karen Clancy, uh, Sky van Valkenburg, um, and of course, all the, the, the people who are, who are there in, in, in the room who were who are managed to, to, to be here in, in person and, and work with us over, over these three three days. Um, so that brings us to the end uh, of, of the workshop. And um, I wish you all the best in, in all, all your projects. Uh, and until next time.